world that have definitely been negatively impacted by just a really quick shutdown of all sports. And it had a ripple effect from professional sports all the way down to just this last Tuesday, we found out the Olympics are being postponed to, to next year for 2021. So you can imagine um, all the dedication and all the training and everything that you guys were doing and all the progress that maybe you, you had made, right? It's all on hold right now, especially for water sports where you can't necessarily just jump into a pool very easily unless you have one in your backyard. So there's, there's definitely a, a cycle that all of us can go through individually in, in, a, in a state of loss, like loss of your, your sport and loss of a piece of your way of expressing yourself physically and maybe even emotionally um, through your sport and through the activity of playing water polo. And, um, you know, part of that is, is going through this process of maybe it's not fully accepting it's happened yet. Or maybe it's not fully realizing um, when it's going to end or being too caught up on that. And, and that can be kind of um, harmful in a way. And a, lot, and a lot of people might be stuck on that and not be ready for when it actually does end because this is temporary. And I think that's something that we need to accept. But beyond that, just accept what we can control within the things that we have power over, which is hard. And it's not something that is easily um, accepted or, or, or supported with the people in your own home, right? So I think that's first and foremost. And it takes a lot of awareness and it takes some um, uh, getting used to and, and adapting, adaptation, right? But at the same time, it, it has happened and you need to find a way to make the most of the situation. Otherwise, the situation will eat you up inside. Um, so some things that I've been working with on athletes through this is establishing a new daily routine. And with all this freedom, right, there can be a lot of silver linings here too. So there, with all this time that you have now being at home and maybe some of your schools have gone online and they're organized or maybe some of your schools are not organized and they're trying to figure out what this online thing is all about, right? So you may or may not already have structure built in place, but as people, we're creatures of habit. And I think through all this, you realize like if, you're, if you take care of yourself as a person first, you'll probably play a little bit better and you'll be a better athlete because you bring yourself into the pool. And so um, with structure, it's things like, now that I don't necessarily have to wake up for anything specifically, maybe I should set up a regular go to sleep time and a regular wake up time because the quality of sleep is really important and the amount of sleep that you get is super important. So that's where I would start with your structure. And then I would build in things like a gratitude practice, maybe writing things down like, all right, what am I grateful for? Because when you start looking for things you're grateful for, you tend to find them. And the same is true for the opposite. When you're looking for all the things that are crappy, right? Or that aren't good or that you can't do, well, you'll probably find those too. And so it's a, it's a matter of kind of like reshaping and re, re, um, reorganizing what you focus on. And, and writing things down and going through these practices help you. So gratitude practice, great time is to start your day with a gratitude practice. Three things I'm grateful for and why. Second is build in time to just disconnect from what you're thinking about, from everything at home, from the situation, right? And, and a good way to disconnect is actually to become more present. And so building in mindful practices and, and um, a great practice obviously is to focus on your breathing, right? And there's a ton of apps out there. Um, I actually partnered with somebody else who happens to be a licensed marriage family therapist, but he's also a certified uh, performance consultant like myself. And we have an app called Well You Mental Training, and it's a bunch of uh, mental training uh, programs and exercises for athletes to work on the mental side of their game. But there's also meditation apps like Mind, like uh, Headspace and Calm. You know, athletes are gravitating towards these now and being more publicly um, connected with them. But um, find something if you need a guide, use an, an app or use a program online and 
stick to it every day. It, it really does help you gain clarity in your thoughts and it helps you actually train your focus and train your attention um, as well as manage some stress that you might be having in your life and deal with some anxiousness that, that could be creeping up on you without you knowing it. Um, and then the last thing that I would say is end your day. So you kind of bookend your day, right? You start with gratitude maybe, and then you end it with reflection. And reflection is what are three good things that I did today or that happened to me today? And something that we're doing with the men's national team is um, we started a group me and one thing that we're doing is we're saying, okay, so what's, uh, what's one mindful practice that you had today? What's one physical activity that you did today? And then what's one new thing that you learned today? And so it's creating connection because we're all sharing these things that we're doing in our isolated space. But it's also creating more understanding of like who, who we are too. Like how do we work together with this person? Because um, we're still going to be competing in the Olympic Games at some point, you know, that unknown timeline. But it's, uh, there's just certain ways that you create structure in your life um, that help you through these unknown times and, and help you sort of understand like, okay, I do have responsibilities. I do have purpose. I know I, it feels boring, but now when I put structure in my life, maybe it's not so boring anymore. I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one who wrote those down, but I wrote them down um, and we'll email them around. Uh, and we've already got group me's. Um, we need to start them for our 14 U's, but uh, we've got some group me's going, Brian. So we can, uh, we can start doing that activity tomorrow. It sounds pretty simple, Yeah, uh, but, cool. but uh, powerful, right? Oftentimes the simple ideas are powerful ones. Yeah. I actually, I learned it from USA men's volleyball. They're doing the same thing. And then they're also sharing pictures of them doing stuff with their family, whether it's those workout videos that you see going around or like, you know, little simple stuff, but it makes a big difference in, in terms of connection and feeling like, hey, we're still a part of something. All right, guys. Uh those are some good thoughts from Brian. Um, four key things to do in a day. Uh, let's use the chat function um, to send uh, to send questions for Brian. And um, while Brian was talking, we had uh, ten more people join, including uh, Lou and maybe her brother uh, Feli from Argentina. So. Um, you guys uh, definitely win the Golden Hubcap Award for the uh, <laughs> for the furthest dial in. But um, let's uh, let's get this going while I wait for questions to come in. Um, just on the group me's, um, what I'll do tomorrow is I'll email around the links to join all the appropriate group me's because I know not everyone is on them. So we'll get those built up um, tomorrow. I'll send those out when I send out the recap of of the suggestions Brian just shared with us. There's Lucia, hey, hi. All right, questions, come on guys. Use the chat to send in questions. Okay, so um, here's a question from uh, Emily Claire. Um, Brian, what, what thoughts do you have on when someone should wake up? That's a really good question. Uh, probably 5 a.m. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, there's a lot to that question, to be honest, because it depends not only on your, uh, what you have to do, right? What, what responsibilities you have in the morning, if there are some right now, but also um, how, what time you went to bed and the quality of your sleep and, um, and, and in general, what you need. And, and there's a lot of research around sleep and performance and, um, you know, 
actually, hold on a sec. I have a book. So this, the guy that wrote this book called Sleep, he's a um, quote unquote sports sleep therapist. He works with some um, British uh, uh, soccer teams like Manchester United and a few other clubs around the world. But um, he talks about a lot of stuff around sleep. And I think it's really interesting because he talks about some people who naturally have energy in the morning, they call them AMers. And then some people who get that surge of energy at night, they call them PMers, right? And then he talks about the, the sleep cycles that you go through and in general what you need in order to feel um, recovered, both mentally and physically, because your sleep is responsible for that uh, muscle regeneration period, so physical recovery, as well as um, neurogenesis, which is, you know, your brain's full of neurons, right? So how do you recover psychologically? And, and then he talks about um, naps and how you can supplement with naps and what are the best times of the day to get a nap. And so I think, um, you know, long, long answer, but at the same time, I think this is a really interesting question because there's a lot that goes into it and it's individualized. So I, I would recommend this book. We actually read it as a national team um, and there's a lot of information in there, but that's, that's kind of my answer. I think that um, you, we're usually most productive in terms of like doing exercise or anything around 9, 10 a.m. I think from a lot of the research that we're seeing, but it also depends on what time you go to bed and how, what the quality of your sleep was and all this kind of stuff. Okay, so let's stick with the national team for a minute, Brian. Um, uh, men's and women's, um, besides the mental practice that you're talking about, what other activities are the national teams doing now? Um, obviously, some you know they're they're spread out uh, geographically, but um, what other what other things are national team folks doing uh, on a daily basis right now? Well, they're doing a lot of the stuff that we're all doing first of all i think everybody's in this at the same ways together no one's really training we're all kind of in a postponed um time period we do have weekly meetings so every week i meet with the team on tuesdays and then tomorrow we're starting with the coaching staff full staff meeting and and uh, the players uh through zoom and then um, we created a, a Google resource site just for the players and the staff. So it outlines our high performance models. So we have a message from our head coach on, and this is for the men's team. I can't really speak for the women's team because I don't work with them. Another guy works with them that I'm in touch with. But um, so with the men's team, we have our, our head coach's message on there with the calendar. And it's obviously changing all the time. Mm. And we've got a section for player workouts, a section for goalie workouts, a section for strength conditioning, for nutrition, for sports psychology, and then uh, another one for like information. And I think that one's pretty important because especially with everything going around and in, in terms of news and, and information as it gets out, I think it's really important to view credible sources of information rather than um, whatever shows up on your newsfeed because there can be what we're calling there can be a lot of hysteria through this infodemic rather than just the pandemic right <laughs> and that can create even more anxiousness and and uncertainty around the situation so uh, we're even helping the athletes know what to go to so that you can isolate um, the amount of information the type of information you you read and I think that's also probably a pretty important for your routine too like how long and how much of it are you going to do each day, or read each day, and consume each day? So what you're saying, Brian, is it's probably not a good idea to spend hours at a time staring at your uh, social media feeds or uh, either on your phone or on your laptop or uh, that kind of stuff, huh? Yeah, well, I, I think you can do it. I think it's useful time, right? Because it's like bubblegum for the mind at times, but be, be wary of where the sources of information are coming from and how it's affecting you. 
Great. Uh, let's see, got other questions coming in. Um, let's see here. Um, so uh, here's a question uh, coming from a couple different folks in different ways. Um, and I actually thought of it uh, because I just saw an interview with Katie Ledecky from the women's, uh, she's a, a gold, multi-time Olympic gold medalist swimmer. And the um, news anchor was interviewing her about the fact that, you know, like, like you talked about earlier, you know, we, we can't just go outside and run uh, if we're a marathon runner or throw the shot put if we're, if we're uh, a field athlete. Um, we need water. Katie Ledecky needs water. And she was literally saying that she had a, a family down the street who had a pool and she had she had the you know the rubber elastic tubing and was swimming in the pool stationary that's the best she can do right now yeah but uh so the, the question is uh along those lines knowing that um knowing that we can't get into our natural environment um, what suggestions do you have from a training perspective for us to keep in mind um to keep us uh trying to simulate the environment as much as we can and to keep us motivated um, while we're doing dry land workout instead of dry land workout followed by a water polo practice. Yeah, I, I think that's, I mean, the first question is more of a training question. The second one is like super juicy and powerful, like the motivational question. So I think the first thing is like, I have a stationary bike in my house and I think that's one of the best ways, especially for water pole players to keep your legs in shape as well as, you know, get your cardio in running's great too, but you know, it's like water athletes, our joints aren't so great. And we're kind of like giraffes, baby giraffes on land. So yeah. I don't do so well with running. And I, so, but I mean, if you can run, that's great. I, that also is great too, to get outside and, 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 um, engage with nature or just outside of your own home and get some fresh air right um but yeah i think the bike's really great and i also think you know um like that's tony azevedo's app six eight sports i don't know if you guys are following them on on social media but they're putting out and usa water polo is even sharing their posts right they're putting out all this great these exercises that you can do um with a ball without a ball right um you don't need a pool necessarily to do them uh, I think that there's a lot that's popping up and, and in the world of volleyball, for example, right, they've started this movement, um, hashtag volley on, and you'll see like all these, these walk volleyball players are getting creative with passing. And then, you know, like the person in the next video, they splice them together and it looks like they're passing it to them. Um, we could do something like that in the water polo community, um, where it, it feels like, Hey, we're connected and we're working on things. But now on the motivational side and on the um, kind of like mentally staying sharp side, I, I think we're not going to necessarily right now without the pool be able to do a lot in terms of improving performance, even though you might surprise yourself. But I think it's more of like a maintaining basic functioning phase, right? Because as water athletes, I mean, the water is everything. So, so, but you can do a lot with visualization. And you can do a lot with practicing, imagining yourself in game-like situations or imagining yourself working on skill sets in your mind's eye and putting yourself mentally in a vivid image of the pool, whether it's imagining the temperature of the pool, um, imagining the, you know, where it is, the colors, you know, basically like imagining the texture of the ball in your hand. Like you can do a lot that is pretty impactful um, that could help you stay motivated in a way but at the same time you might use this time as a way to really reflect and see okay like why do I play this sport what do I hope to gain in the long term and what's my vision for myself this is going to be unique to you and being really clear on that motivational statement and maybe it's a mission statement right like for example I was just on a um, call with a rugby player and he was, he's in the rugby, USA rugby pipeline. And he was talking about, 
how his motivation was gone because he can't compete in all these things. And, and so we separated his motivation from his goals because they're different. Motivation supports your goals. When it, when an event leaves or, you know, when you don't have that anymore, then what, if you don't have the motivation that keeps you dri keeps driving you and keeps pushing you. So, you know, we arrived at a motivational statement um, where his pursuit is to improve every day, right, by honing his craft. And that didn't have any attachment to nationals. It didn't have any attachment to a championship. All it was was how can you get better every day? And, and part of that right now is being creative and adapting to the situation and finding power in the areas that you have power over. Uh, there's a lot to lot to unpack on that. Um, gives me some good ideas of some activities we can do um, as a team individually uh, in the next couple of weeks. So um, uh, look for some follow up on that uh, with you guys individually from the coaching staff. Uh, here's a great question uh, for you, Brian, personally. Um, uh, Hayes wants to know um, how you became the mental skills coach for the national team. Obviously, you were on the national team for almost a decade, um, but uh, talk us through from a career perspective. We've, we've got like five more minutes, so talk us through from a career perspective how, how you got to this being part of your everyday. Sure. Yeah, I, I love this question because I didn't know how I was going to do it when I first started. So, um, you know, the, well, I had interest from a selfish point of view on the mental side of my own performance. And I knew sports psychology became a thing because I went through it. Uh, I saw psychologists for uh, times during my sophomore year. And then when we got to the national team, Team. We had a sports psychologist assigned to our team from the U.S. Olympic Committee, and um, I just I did I actually at first like I I was like this is a hack this is stupid um, he's having us sit and breathe and I don't buy into it what are we doing I want to I want to go work out or be active and then after we started doing it a little bit more and I started realizing what you know, through self-awareness, some of the areas that I needed to really work on in terms of focus and refocus and emotional control um, as results happened or just attention, you know, learning how to aim my attention on the things that mattered. Um, I started to buy into it and then I started seeing some results because I started really uh, making the process mine versus trying to follow what somebody else was saying. And, and then after that, I was like, huh, this is something that I'm interested in. Let me start picking his brain. And so I just started learning about it a little bit more and what he does on a daily basis. And, you know, so what I do on a daily basis is I meet with individuals, I meet with teams, I do workshops, I do seminars. Um, sometimes, not very often, I might talk to a parent or two. Um, you know, I, did, I started this app and, you know, just all these ideas and then creating worksheets and reading research and, and learning what all those sources were. So I think like that general interest in helping other people is kind of what it's morphed into since I stopped playing and I realized like now it's not all about me, but I went back to school, got a master's in sports psychology and I got certified as a mental performance consultant with the largest international sports psychology association called the Association for Applied Sports Psychology. And, um, and yeah, and just working at it every day and, and realizing ethically what I can and can't do because there are a lot of ethics around helping people and knowing your training and what you can even call yourself. Like for example, at the beginning of this, you introduced me as a sports psychologist, right? And I'm not ethically allowed to call myself a psychologist because I don't have a doctorate and I'm not licensed in my state. Well, I, so what I call myself, it's fine. It's fine, but everybody gets it. And I practice sports psychology, right? But I'm a mental coach and it's 
it's, it's this weird thing in the field, but at the same time, I mean, it's all about what's your training, what do you focus on? And my focus is performance enhancement or performance-based needs. It's not around clinical. It's not like I'm going to sit you on a couch and diagnose you and, you know, as a psychiatrist might do prescribe you medicine. I, I would refer somebody for all those things if they needed that kind of level of support. So, um, yeah, I mean, all my answers are super long. Sorry, guys, but, but there's a lot to, to these things. <laughs> All right, um, we have about one minute left. Uh, let me just scan and see. Um, we had a lot of questions, but they uh, a number of them uh, linked up to the themes we've covered already. Um, let's see if we get one more sneaking in here at the end. Okay, so um, that's let's have that be a wrap for tonight. Um, thank you to Brian Alexander very much. And uh, we ended up with 25, uh, 25 people on the call. Plus I see um, like Team Beeman is there. So uh, Andrew's still locked in the basement, coming home from Central America. Is he still in the basement? Yeah, okay. Team Sherman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, hey, something, Stu, something real quick. I mean, yeah. if any of you guys want to reach out or anything, um, yeah, I'm going to send that out tomorrow. Send an email and yeah. 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 So, um, I'll share my notes. Uh, I'll share my notes from this call. I'll share um, a link to the app that Brian was talking about. Well, you, and I'll also send a direct link to Brian, uh, and his professional website. So if you want to reach out, you can, absolutely do that. So um, thank you very much, Brian, for your time. And it uh, looks like the sun's still out um, for you. It's, it's dark here, but uh, the good news is now we can't see all the pollen uh, that's falling. So um, it's so thick right now that it's, uh, it turns your car green. I'll, I'll send you a picture of it in the morning. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta check that out. <laughs> um, all right. Hey, thanks everybody. Uh, like I said, I'll send an email out tomorrow with a follow-up on all this. Please keep doing your dry land. Um, look for a special surprise from us on dry land tomorrow, uh, maybe Saturday. And um, let's do a better job of sharing our dry land work on social media because we're not really doing that yet. So uh, the coaches have a low level of confidence that you're doing. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Brian. Find Appreciate you very much. Find a different reason why to do dry land. Not because your coaches say, but because you want to do it for another reason. That's right. Maybe there's a purpose behind it bigger than that day. That's right. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you.